we we completed that, right? Yes. Um, and then, so we have all the tools in place, and that's what the Cyrus pipeline, um, you know, the work was as Cyrus pipeline tools. And then the second one, you said that you know you have you have completed one API uh, oh. generation of once. What was what was that part? Of? It's it's API implementation. So up till now, what we have published is API only. Like uh, what was uh, what will be actually used in Sonic. However. It, in parallel to the sonic work uh, by the vendors like e each of the vendors needs to uh, provide implementation of those apis right and in parallel to that we are working on simulation so as a backend we are using bmv2 simulator and our goal is to generate sci api implementation which is translation from sci to p4 runtime to be able to configure the simulator and uh, run it uh, in Sonic. Okay, good. So is, is that is that generation of the SI API is also automated? SI API is already op uh, automated. Sorry, uh, implementation, I'm sorry. Implementation, mm -hmm. as I said, we have a reference which was done manually. Now we are working on automation. Okay, so so then then objective is to moving forward uh, we expect even the implementation of the sci api which is essentially is the p4 runtime code to be uh, auto generated uh, which could run on the bmv2 simulation yeah yeah so you will have an up to date uh, simulation whenever we change p4 okay and then we expect even the ones that we have deviated from to also be working on the BMP2? Yeah, uh, like enhancing uh, P4 compiler and BM and both BMV2 uh, to support uh, those, uh, this piece of code as well, yeah. Okay. So th this is in the to-do list uh, in the uh, current tool chain PR. You can take a look at that. Is that right? So, here? yeah, Marion, are you going? Um, uh, I know you're familiar with it, but the changes that we're proposing for fragmentation and how to end connections, and um, are you uh -huh. planning on having that in the people runtime model in the three weeks? Or what What are you delivering in three weeks? Uh, so in three weeks, it's only the match action portion, which includes uh, routing plus uh, ACLs. Um, the changes with regards to fragmentations and ACs, they are related to connection tracking, which is not yet supported by the simulator. So this is another uh, work that we will be doing after we have initial uh, version of uh, all of the layers working. Then we will expand it for the connection tracking as well, and we will include that them. We have, however, the like the reference code which is not currently compiled for connection tracking. So it's just uh, let's say it, it's just uh, there for documentation purposes. So we need to do the work to actually compile it and be able to run this. So uh, somehow we need to get a full schedule to what we're getting and when, because it's, uh, it's not much use until we have the full implementation. Um, and it sounds like you're, you're doing a partial implementation for three weeks and then at some point and it doing more. And I'm just wondering if we need help here, like this is, uh, yeah, we definitely do, and this is what we were asking for because I cannot parallelize more. So if someone can uh, help with the outstanding items uh, during those three weeks, mm -hmm. that's something we could use, but uh, uh, that's as much as we can do. We first are focusing on delivering at least something working, and then we will be expanding. Okay, I think, uh, Christina, we need to be looking for volunteers who are willing to actually code. Yeah. So what kind of skill set does someone need to have to help out, Marian? Um, so there, there are two, basically two projects that are involved there. First one is the compiler, 
so we need to have uh, to be able to um, to dig into the P4 compiler front end. And second one is uh, the simulation tool, which is basically a software switch. So the uh, familiarity with those two would be the most advantageous. Okay, and is there anyone on the call who has that skill set? Just yay or nay? I I do not, mm -hmm. but um, I mean I know people who do, and I host a like a public meeting every couple of weeks for p4.org for people that are interested in learning internals of those tools and how they're developed. Okay. So not not an answer, but a maybe a partial lead. Um, anyone else on the call have this kind of skill set who might be able to help out? Because I don't know everyone's background. I apologize. Yeah. Or or somebody from your organization that can contribute. In, in general, the people with this skill set tend to be people who are paid to do it or who are doctoral students who it's their their graduate research work today. Yeah, well. Joining a group like this, uh, we assume the companies are big enough that yes, the people are all paid. I get paid. <laughs> that's a that's a given. Uh, but you know, it's like in Sonic, like there's lots of people coding, and they're all paid by their companies. I, I really wish to head off the wishful thinking that somebody just might come along and do it for free. <laughs> <laughs> You know, if I could, if I had the skill set, I would do it myself, Marian. Well, um, I will clarify. It's just like Sonic. If there's no contribution from the member, then certainly there'd be no, no, uh, um, no way for us to buy from that company. Right? You have to contribute, and so. Just like Sonic, we don't buy a Sonic box from any company that didn't heavily contribute to the coding of Sonic, right? That was like a number one thing in order to be even uh, evaluated because when you go to support it, if you're not if you're not familiar with the coding practices and what's in it, how could you ever support it? So um, we should keep that in mind if you're uh, wanting to do business with Microsoft. Um, I can also reach out privately to each company and see if there's resources. Yeah, I, I think I would, um, mm -hmm. Christina, because we have to have each company needs to have some contributions. Yeah, in I'm this happy area. About that. Yeah. Are you talking about in the people or pipeline area, Gerald? Uh, it's if if you if you're not familiar, the P4 pipeline is that is what everything will be referenced off of. So yeah. you can yeah. have your own implementation of, of that fine, but if you don't understand the P4 pipe mile, uh, pipeline, you never contributed or, or involved with it, then it's highly unlikely that you've written the code properly. No, I, I got you. No, no. Uh, uh, so you were talking in, in general terms, uh, yeah. but, but we're really talking about road number seven for making use of P4 pipelines. Yeah. Uh, with that mean that is because um, remember this dash doesn't define an implementation so dash can only define apis and behavioral models I, uh, I, and, and so that's what this whole group is about so i understand yeah, I yeah, we're not asking people to contribute their code because first they wouldn't contribute their code right? uh or at least not today uh, so the code that we're producing is the behavioral model, which is uh, uh, built off this uh, P4 behavioral uh, of some sort, whether it's this uh, BM2 or whether it's the, the next generation of that. Yeah, but that's what this organization is trying to do. Uh, right, which is OK, which is why I spoke up and asked, because this is talking about P4 specifically, as opposed to a behavioral model that I could go write, you know, uh, ARM core C code to implement if I really wanted a software version, if I thought there was some better reason for that. I'm not sure there is, but in principle, I could. And I could say, I'm obeying Dash APIs because I wrote some software 
and uh, I tap the packet to that software. I do my thing to them and then send them on their way. Uh, but, to the but, but we all agreed at the beginning we're not doing that. We're only going to have one set of behavioral models that we're going to do all our testing and baselining off of. We can't have everybody come up with their own. That doesn't help anybody. No, no, no. So, so I'm saying something different, Gerald. Mm -hmm. if, if I wrote software where you couldn't tell the difference. I, I mean, so it, again, are we are we defining P4 pipelines with APIs for P4 pipelines? Or are we defining behavior models for functions with APIs to con configure and control the the model? No, we we agreed at the beginning we're going to use the P4 pipeline to define behavioral models. We're not. Oh. Okay. And APIs and software and the software generation, auto software generation of that behavior. Okay, so that's fair. So Christine, Christine, reach out uh, directly to us. This is uh, uh, I, I get I get it now. So Gerald and Christina, reach out directly to to Dell uh, through me, and we'll have a we we need to have a discussion on part of this. Uh, but got you. I understand. I'm that that answers everything I needed, Gerald. Thank you very much. Yeah, I also just want to make sure there's no no uh, misunderstanding. The actual implementation does not have to be P4. We're only talking about behavioral models, which do need to be P4 based. Got it. That's what I say. So let yeah, yeah. we yeah yeah okay. No, that's enough. For, that's enough for the for this meeting. I get the request. Thank you very much for the description. I now understand um, what exactly what you're asking for here on number seven. And I don't know if it, maybe it helped other people too. So thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. I hope it helped everyone else. Um, does anyone else on the call have questions about this? I, I think I want to clarify one thing. I think if people should understand at least what, the way I understood from Marianne is that the people that we are looking for is essentially, you know, to work on the P4 compiler, not to really define the B4 models. And the right? software switch. And, and also the, the software simulation tool. So there are two things. So there are essentially are the, the the framework or the tools or so forth which will allow us to you know be prepared for for this kind of a work here so that you know that's 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 the skill set that we are really interested but, in right but why do you why do okay so why is that important for dash to define uh because the compiler and so on is a per vendor based on their pipeline so if we're defining p4 no this is a no 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 i think the, 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 the yeah the behavior model yeah. yeah, so the behavior model, uh, I guess, you know, um, Joseph, that 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 we have defined, you know, especially Marianne and NVIDIA is they, they devi deviate from the original specification, right? Like connection mm -hmm. tracking, this fragmentation work or any other things that we have defined. So we do need to expand all those tools to, yeah, to really so, support this one. Yeah, so the goal is the tools will be there so that we can just change the P4 behavioral model and then we can spit out the new APIs and 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 software that models that. That's the goal of the tools. So in the end, once we have those tools, then we can just modify at will the P4 behavioral model to any discussion that we all agree on. Like this week, we talked about how to close a connection. So. At that point, once you have the tools, we can make those changes in P4 and automatically generate those APIs and software uh, behavioral model without somebody trying to handcraft that, or it, it'll it'll come straight from the P4 code itself. So the the goal is to rapidly once once the first version is done and somebody notices anything wrong, we're going to just change the code. But we don't have to worry about the tools anymore. So that's why it's important to get to the stage where we have those tools, so that we're solely focused on the behaviors and uh, uh, writing the, the the model that represents yeah. the behaviors. So yeah, so I'm not going to fully commit, but we might we might have someone in one of um, our, our, one of our teams who could actually do that kind of work, but I have to talk to. Uh, I, there's a bunch of discussion, so as I said, reach out, reach out to me privately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll so reach that, out. That, that helps define as well. So again, some of this stuff, it's like I, I got it, Gerald. Thank you, thank you again. Yeah, yeah. That helps as well. I, I'm getting this figured out. Okay.
And so, so not to put you on the spot, I'll reach out to everybody just to see, you know. Well, I'm saying that I might have, I might be able to free up a mm -hmm. you know, time yep. for someone to help. Thank uh, you. Not, but I'm not committing. <laughs> no, I got you. Because it's complicated. But, but we do have someone who knows how to do this, some of this kind of thing. So who's done mm -hmm. it before. So, okay. Thank you. Great. Great. Hey, hey, Christina, this is Suresh from Fungible. I, mean, I don't have fee for experts, but I think I have fee for background. So let me, I want to understand what Mariam said. So it is one thing to know, understand the fee for as a language to define the pipeline, right? But it's another thing uh, to know the internals of the fee for compiler. So are we looking at, you know, modifications to the compiler or modifications to the pipeline definition? To the, the compiler? compiler knowledge may be more niche. For for, for the re for the reason that uh, current standard or of of the P4 language does not cover everything we want to express in the pipeline. We we need all kind of uh, help here, right? So we need to extend the compiler. This is one thing to do, and maybe since it is it require more per knowledge, uh, Marian, we we can handle that now. We need to extend the BMV2 to support all the new functionality like contract uh, fragmentation and so on. This is an this is a purely C++ code, so I be I believe we can it it will be easy, easier to find people that can do that. Uh, and we need uh, help if the community if people here are willing to help us with the translating uh, creating the translation layer between uh, sci to p4 if, to pi which is another area sci to what to to, to to pi to p4 runtime like to to the oh, oh, to okay. language that bmv2 currently understands it sounds like a good written description of all the begging projects would be helpful so yeah i can expand on that Right. Yeah, I think that's that's what we need. That way we can start building a schedule around it and understand the scope and who can help and uh, start, uh, you know, uh, assigning people to the different paths. Uh, right now it's it's all in Mellanox, so there's no description because they're doing it all themselves, which won't scale long term and is not the purpose. Um, so, uh, Maddie, do you sense. think you can take a stab at what, what needs to get done so we can start really probing who can help where? Yes, of course. Uh, we will work together with Maria. Actually, we will try to break it into kind of a tasks. Mm -hmm. uh, and do then you want me to help with that, Maddie. Do you want to meet with Yumi and Marian to set up? Yeah, yeah we, we can do that. We can do that. Break it into tasks. It can be quite. Uh, not a huge one, like a medium sized one, and then people mm -hmm. can jump in and take some tasks. We mm -hmm. okay. will help you get in order to ramp, to ramp up. I, I really, really believe we need to work as a community and, and, mm -hmm. and work together in order to, to accelerate that. I'm pretty good at creating timelines. That's great. <laughs> so I'll, I'll set up some time for us to do that. And then we can present it. Yeah, I think um, in the past, you know, I know that, you know, in Sonic, once you had all the tasks, you could, that, that, that is the key, because then you can, you can ask for volunteers and they'll volunteer against a task and there'll be names against it and dates. So yeah, perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, then what was next this week? Um, we, we've talked at length about the fragment paper and we have one more meeting to close off. Oh, Marian, we did have a question for you yesterday and uh, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but John Carney had had a question where he looked into the P4 code and he saw a double encapsulation somewhere. Um, John, can you remember where that was? Um, I, I was just not sure whether there was an appliance encapsulation and then uh, another encapsulation or or not. I had thought that I had seen that, but I think then yesterday when we looked through the code, we couldn't really find it. So um, I, I'm not sure, but mm -hmm. I mean, I guess if you could just answer the question, like yeah. do, you, do you know of any case where there's a double tunnel? 
Um, I think I know of one of them, but it's not really a common case. This is what I uh, reviewed with, together with Goan. Uh, it's when the packet is coming, I guess, from another region. It will go uh, through an SLB and it may have two layers of encapsulation. First Correct. one being left over from the SLB and second mm -hmm. one is your VNet VXLAN. Yeah. That's Any? exactly what they were saying yesterday. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I can also so, confirm it. This uh, is the SLB there, traffic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Michael yeah. said that there was uh, more than one case like that. Um, so. We guessed right. Yeah. We guessed correctly. Yeah. yeah. SLB was one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, so sometimes you want to bounce through uh, a managed NAT or, or something like that. So there are, there are cases where you want to bounce through something else before going off. So you need to encapsulate once more. Uh, so that capability definitely has to be there. Yep. So you were okay. not you were not um, wrong, John. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. And um, did did the before we move on to HA, did did the SDN team want to talk about anything today, or should we move on? I think we can move on. Okay, great. Um, so Bud did propose a HA um, protocol PR. Not sure if anyone had had a chance to take a look. This is basically a description and a set of requirements, right? Uh, the recent pull request about HA. It's not really a proposal of any protocol yet, but it's it's description. Okay. Uh, are you on the line? Um, maybe. Or is there something else? Yeah. This no, is that it. that's the place to start, guys. So yeah. Okay. Okay. We haven't uh, looked at this. But do you want to describe kind of what you did here? Sure. Um, so um, I started thinking about the HA um, requirements and. Um, uh, interactions between the two paired devices and started thinking about what the protocol looked like and the packet formats would look like. And um, so based on that, um, I mean, something that became apparent is that because the communication path between the two devices is not 100% reliable, um, we have to be careful that when you have one of these paired DPUs and you're you are receiving messages from your peer that are telling you to insert entries into your flow table. Uh, you have to be careful that you don't wind up in a situation where you are unable to remove those entries. Um, like normally, the peer will tell you to insert a flow entry, and then when it ages it out it'll tell you to remove that flow entry from your own table. And that's and that's all good. Um, but if the communication path between the two is not 100% reliable, then there's going to be cases where a remove message is sent that from your peer that you don't receive. And so that will create like zombie flow entries. And eventually the flow table will fill up with those. So that's that's the uh, end. So sorry, you want can to I ask you a question? Why do you need to send a remove message? I mean, the other flow table will have a timer as the primary flow table, and we remove an entry exactly on the same principle of the primary flow table. Well, the 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 the, the DPU that's receiving the the packets is constantly updating its timer, right? Whenever a new packet arrives, um, that that constant updating isn't happening on the peer. So let's so say say the timeout was like one minute or something like that for the for a flow. Um, the the active DPU that's getting that flow, say he's getting um, like a packet every second. No, I understand. I understand. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. A good so, point. So can't you send a refresh every once in a while in the same way you are refreshing the hardware not to delete an entry? Yeah, yes. and that's basically what, what the proposal is. Great. So the proposal is over UDP or TCP? Um, the the 
flow messages themselves, I was proposing being UDP, um, but I was also proposing there would be a control channel, like a low bandwidth control channel that was TCP to coordinate things like when like a perfect sync started and ended, uh, things like that. That's fine. Yeah, or capabilities. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I like I like the document quite a bit. I think it made it so easy to understand. I had a hard time understanding some of the earlier discussions, but it was really clear and uh, it's, it seems real pragmatic. Yeah, I uh, haven't uh, read this. I'm I'm anxious to read it. I added some comments with regard to looking how we're going to go testing it because something that's complicated and dynamic in real time, you want to build the testing capability. I don't mean conformance testing, even just observability of it, right? To know if it's really working right rather than it being a mysterious black box and looking at the traffic generators for the final result, right? You really want to know what's going on, like have probing and other things. So I put some thoughts with regard to that, not solutions, but just uh, questions, right? goals and, and yeah I, I agree Chris all that stuff is really important yeah I mean I'm, I started out as a hardware developer and so everything had test points and probes right it's just the way you bring up hardware and so I end up doing software the same way even if it's old school um, and uh, so that's why I put those thoughts in there and I want to think about putting together a, a diagram because I think visually and that kind of describes this and we can have like a reference diagram or architecture that, that kind of shows it pictorially. And then we can point at the figure and have things to talk about. I'm going to take a stab at that if that's OK, bud. Sure. That'd be great. Will that diagram go into this document or the original HA document provided by Microsoft Engineering in the, in the markdown file? Are, are we somehow going to combine the two at some point? Maybe at some point, let them, um, they're talking about an implementation here. And okay. so it's going, you know, ours was guidance. Let's see okay. how this goes. Maybe we can do some combination in the future, but really anxious to see what the protocol designers are going to come up with there. Yeah, I think it's good to have some scratch pad working documents and we can sort it all out, figure out how to yeah. merge later, sure. right? Great. Yeah, I'm curious to see uh, how the zombie flows um our handle is it going to be event based uh you know do we need refresh and uh yeah uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, thoughts uh, that we have uh, as well and just to see this document and we'll post some comments there maybe we can take the action that the next time we meet that everybody has read this document and and is prepared with questions um, i'm not prepared with any questions because i've read but uh, certainly will now. I know that it's there. I, I threw out a couple of other provocative ideas in, in my comments. And one is, are we going to need an API to manage the HA algorithm itself? We have a SI API to manage the data plane, but this is kind of like a controller that's fairly sophisticated. And at some point, we may want a management API to it. Like, give me a count of how many active flows there are, or tell me the state of your state machine, or something like that. I, I don't know what the um, the things are that we want to manage, but it brings up that question to me. How do you talk to this controller? How do you observe it? Do we want telemetry coming out of it that's configurable to turn on or off? High fidelity telemetry. Um, I think I had another another point I'm trying to remember. But those are the kinds of questions I, I, I put in the, my uh, comments. Got it. And, and just FYI, guys, I did send a note to the community saying we had this to review. Did everyone receive this? Probably, Christina. You know, I, I just didn't. Emails a lot tough. Of them, Emails so. tough. If there's another way you'd like me to communicate, you know, please let me know. Um, but yeah, it, it should be in your email somewhere or you can come to the repo. Yeah, I, it, you know, I appreciate it, it, but that was really cool of you to submit mm -hmm. and put out there. Yeah. OK, yeah, and in fact, I mean, we we have uh, a bunch of thoughts with a lot more detail than this, mm -hmm. but we kind of wanted to propose this as something to put out there to discuss because there's no point in going to more detail, uh, which will have its own 
um, I'm sure, set of comments and and, and discussion right. before uh, to I mean before getting the the general picture agreed upon. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm I remember. Just looking at a reviewer here. Who, yeah. who wants? Yeah, I'm I, just going to do this as an experiment. So a couple of other provocative ideas I threw out there. I, I re reviewed my uh, comments. One is, would we want a behavioral model of a controller? And is this something that deserves at some point simulation, like in an NS3 type of uh, you know, program or something? Is it is it of that yeah. nature? I do think that is true. We want a simulation of this. So food for yes, thought. I didn't receive the email, um, so this will be helpful. To add. Oh, great. And I don't I'm not an NS3 wonk, but there are many people who who do that as their living or hobby or part of their job. And maybe that's a fun thing to think about. And I got the email, uh, Christina. Oh, good. good. So one of the things uh, in response to um, Chris's question on the API part for, you know, just in response to to this protocol discussion, one thing we we should probably understand that you know this kind of elaborate protocol and all those uh, you know the communication that we are talking about, uh, we don't expect this one to be implemented in the hardware, right? No, no. It, it, right. Yes, it, it will be part of the hardware. If it's not implemented in Albert, it would never work. It depends on what you mean by that. There, there'll be a lot of hardware interactions with this. Flow. There'll be, flow yeah, there'll be hardware interactions. Be, yeah, flow state will be sent from there. It's not going to go through, uh, you know, every flow you get, you're not going to go send that up to software uh, in the operating system. We need to find a different name for that because lots of people their hardware is really software, but you don't send it somewhere. It's automatically these updates have to be sent out in conjunction with the data path. Now, whether there's stuff on top of that to help control, it's a different story, but you can't, you can't keep flow state by sending on oh, making a, making a connection. I send it up to the OS who then starts generating messages over to another, like you'd never keep up. You still need to maintain your 5 million connections per second or 3 million or 2 million, whatever you can do, but it's extremely high rate. You're not going to get that out by sending it uh, into software domain. To, to no, that, that is understood. That is understood, Gerald. So I think this this is probably, you know, we are not sending all these flows into the software. However, you know, the software, which is very close to the hardware, perhaps running in some sort of an embedded core, is really scanning all those flows that are, you are creating those those you know uh, uh, those automated flows that are created for the fast path you you are scanning them and then really sending them so keeping all I don't those know if you're doing I actually don't know if that's what you do. it depends on the implementation but I think that in some cases when the connections are coming in and they're created that information will be sent to a queue uh, it can be combined with others but uh, it, it, it doesn't need to be something scanning in the background, right? It can be created fully in the in the data path by combining these these uh, connection states and sending them off the other side. I don't think uh, you do that. I don't think you do that by scanning. Um, uh, Gerald, the first creation can be uh, the way you suggest, but any subsequent refresh. Uh, you know, yeah, you are, that, yeah, I agree. That's what I say. It's a combination, but the the actual flow state will have to be done out of the hardware. The refresh sound, uh, makes sense. That can be done slower because that timer is much longer. Um, so I agree. So it'd be some combination. But what I'm saying is, it couldn't be that it was all done out of you know software. It just you just never keep up. Right, right. Understood. And then you know, to my point is that whether it's a refresh or whether it's the first time. Uh, you know, just to answer Chris's question about the API, we will need uh, some sort of API to to really access to those, you know, uh, all those hardware entries, right? Yeah. Gonna have to come up with some good names for uh, 
fast and slow path for AJ. <laughs> so we use that fast and slow path way too many times and mean different things depending on the topic. So maybe we can standardize on s some way of separating those things. In the AJ think of it in terms of like a sync channel and a, and a management or a sync channel and a controller channel or something. Yeah. But, I mean, in general, there's there's performance requirements, and then however you implement the covers is let the price per hour performance ratios come out as they may, and that's how you decide which ones are worth buying. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? A lot of the details, even though you know people made that argument with the uh, hey, it doesn't matter whether we just process um, things uh, fast path only or slow path only or a combination, and then when we came to Fragmentation made a huge difference. I think it's 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 better that we at least describe it in a in a manner of how you just how you implement it can be different, but I think that it's pretty obvious here that there is a fast and a slow path to this, or a fast and a control channel to this, and I think it's um, worth outlining. Otherwise, we won't have much to debate on how the corner cases actually exist. So. Behavioral models, main goal of the behavioral models is to actually allow us to identify the corner cases so that we can write tests and make sure that they're all covered off. So the the you know we need to make some stand of like what that should look like. And then I don't care how you implement it in the end, but the behavioral model should be something that conceivably could be implemented. Uh, not something that is just completely uh, abstract that we never find any corner cases or um, for the for the test cases which we so dearly need. And HA is going to be super complex to test, so we're going to need um, to be. Um, you, we will need a behavior model for it, and we'll need to describe that. And like I say, how you implement it? Okay, sure, go off and do what you want. But the reality is the corner cases. The behavioral model should be good enough that you can identify all the corner cases. Good goal. Uh, Gerald, mm -hmm. uh, on that uh, thought, I have a question about the interop requirement between vendors. Because, uh, you know, as you said, testing HA is hard. And uh, even if the protocol is public, even if the format is public and the behavior model is something that's standard, there will be cases that will show up under performance duress. And uh, for example, one implementation might be perfectly OK sending millions of updates to another implementation, uh, which cannot handle that. And mm -hmm. so uh, there'll be other differences, like capacities so, will be different. So I think that I, I, I agree with everybody who's saying it's really like when you mix it, um, things get um, Harder, and I think that our first goal is to have uh, one model that that uh, specifies the behavior. And originally, we're going to pair like for like anyways. But what I don't want is never having that ability. And more, what I don't want is having no ability to test it. So, like, I want a, the a way to test it for everyone. And um, whether yours is faster than somebody else's makes it a little bit harder. I think that's fair. That that's that might be a little bit longer uh, goal to mix it, but we have to start with the goal of being able to mix it. Uh, initially, we'll find all the corner cases, we'll write the test plans for it, and we would test, you know, like for like in the beginning until we get enough experience, and then after that. We could test mixes and find out what you know the, the potential issues are, and it's typically performance, right? Like there's a lot of uh, there could be a, a a big performance difference between one vendor and another. But the critical point is, I need to have only one set of test cases that everybody goes in. Your performance is going to be different. We understand that, and um, and initially, you know, I think. It's quite reasonable that everybody would um, would deploy HA uh, pairs, but as we've talked in the past, the problem comes you know later when we go and add a new, more efficient you know um, appliance. Piece of hardware. So now it's now it's no longer 
um, the same, even if it's from the same company, um, it, it could have the exact same problems that we're talking about, which is, oh, it's so much faster and can update so much faster than the original appliance, and you could have issues there that we're going to have to address um, over sure, time. I understand, and, and yeah. I'm all for it. Uh, you know, the only comment I would make is that the worst time to find out that you have an interrupt problem is when you actually require the HA in an operational network. Yeah. Right? And when you have all of these permutations, you create a that matrix of what needs to be tested against what, and that uh, you know that may be difficult to do um, prior to your deployment. You will actually find out these corner cases when you are deploying it, and uh, well, they will show up in the behavior model. You know that that is one difference between this group and other groups is we're trying to create behavior models so that the suppliers actually know the exact behavior that they're supposed to deploy. Right? It's not like. We're just waiting until you finally give us something. You should have the behavioral model, and your hardware model should match the behavior of the behavioral model. And to avoid, you know, a lot of uh, what in the past would have been uh, a lot of misunderstandings. Yeah, we're already um, thinking about system testing of HA, and you know, cooking up ideas. And um, you know, we hope to be ahead of the the game there in terms of having some ideas for everyone to look at before we can get to that point. And um, another comment is good old plug fests, right? That's how the industry resolves interrupt problems from a pragmatic point of view. Everyone does their best job of implementing what they think the standard is, but then you hook up different things in a lab and, and watch the sparks fly and, and then go. everyone goes back and retools. So, you know, there's practical and an academic approach to this and we'll use both. I can say from experience too, you know, I've gone from lab to the staging environment to pre-production pilots out to production and I've found things in production that I sh that I thought for sure I would catch in the prior three that because of the scale, I, I just didn't, I just couldn't, you know, and so hopefully we can catch, you know, 85% of issues. Yeah. I, th I think everybody right. knows that AJ is hard, guys. Like, there's yeah. no doubt about it. This is a hard topic. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to be the toughest part. Um, we'll get that data path going and, you know, resolved. And I think we're coming to, you know, to an ending on at least describing what should be in the in the data path for, for the VNet. AJ will be much harder. Um, That's why we have the brightest minds here on the call. Well, and hopefully some people that work for them that are even brighter. <laughs> so I have a lot of bright people who work for me. So um, yeah, acknowledge this is this is tough, but let's. Uh, if it wasn't tough, it wouldn't be interesting anyway. So. Right. And um, I guess the next topic is um, I have a draft in almost actually it's mostly complete where we're describing. Um, different customer scenarios and um, you know whether whether we're doing an explicit LPM or inserting a firewall between VNets or if we're um, you know doing default internet traffic one way but trusting other traffic another way and or if we're doing private link and doing mappings or routes and things like that and uh, Michael Miele and I are writing that up and maybe we'll be able to present that at some point as just like a auxiliary document to look at. Yeah, that's a very important document and some people were on a call yesterday where we talked about it. Mm -hmm. And she's doing the inbound stuff now and has to do no outbound stuff now and, and uh, they need to add the inbound stuff. But yeah, this is going to be very important. And if Mario's uh, still on the line, like this is not stuff that you had access to before, Mario, because we're just writing it now based on feedback of things that we're missing. And this is going to definitely change the P4 behavior model. Um, because right now the P4 behavior model is uh, too simplistic on the uh, on the uh, lookup. I and think all of us zoom in on the technology and what we're trying to do, but we don't take a step back and pretend we're the customer in front of the portal, portal.whatevercloud.com, 
creating the vnets and the vms and the the rules and what we want our environment to look like and that's what we're actually doing is you know put yourself in the customer shoes and you know how you as a customer want to you know configure your environment and route your traffic and that's what we're doing and i think we were missing that piece uh, is this already there it looks like you already have a link uh... mm, i have a draft no. PR. Oh, yeah. I have a draft PR, so yeah, it's not. It's not. So I, have to it. I need to review it with Michael Zygmunt okay. uh, to mm -hmm. make sure it's right or get some feedback. And then do I'll we, out. Do so we've got eight minutes it? left. Um, any other burning questions this week? Or is is that is that document trying to cover just the first use case of VNet, or are we talking about uh, no? There's probably more. End to, okay, there's more to that. There's more to it. Okay. But I'm happy. So I, yeah. People. Yeah, the, the reason I was asking is because if at least, you know, these the current T4 model that I see it, uh, they, they are only going as far as basically the first use case is concerned, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm, no, but I think the Vina to Vina even still needs to do this. This this is uh, uh, this is required even in the base Vina Vina model. It's not uh, You'll have to implement it within that model. It, we couldn't deploy a VNet, for example, without this forwarding table, without these capabilities. Understood, Gerald. So I think what is going to happen is that essentially there will be the P4 behavior model, which are common across any use case, right? Yeah. And then there will be the ones that are essentially are going to be just are addressing one. So it helps everyone understand what are we targeting. And not really get confused in terms of you know yeah. getting pulled but across multiple ones. That's what I'm saying though. This is the forwarding table. This is the common use case. This is the base use case of a VNet. And okay. so uh, you know, VNet sometimes has to, um, you know, that packet has to go through a filter before it reaches the other side, or it has to go through a load balancer before it reaches the other side, or it has to go to the internet, you know. Uh, or it, it's an exception to going out, you know, so it is the base VNet case. And uh, as soon as Christina puts it out, you'll see that we need this in the base case. There's nothing we can do in the base case without the porting table uh, having these capabilities. So it's not something for future. It is something that you just need as the base VNet. And it's normal things that any customer would do, you know. It's it's not rocket science. Yeah, so that that so actually don't, defines don't it. Yeah. Hmm? Right. So that defines another work stream for the community to say yeah. that okay, you know, this is something that we need to achieve. We need to achieve a base model to cover this thing, and we need to define the timeline, and then we need to see okay, now this we have achieved this essentially this behavior model. Which is we are saying that it's it's now complete. It addresses it, and then you know we can go from it. Because so far, if people need to look at it, that this is still a work in progress, then you know we 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 have to really define when we're going to be complete, right? Yeah. yeah, and and I do need to review it with Michael as well. To make sure I I have to take feedback from Michael um, before I put it out. So. Thanks. But uh, anything else? We we have five minutes left, and I do have ten o'clock today. Hey, uh, I have one question. I don't know if this is uh, is a pretty simple question. I don't know if it's been um, addressed before. Um, do we have an indication or a knowledge of what the maximum aging timeout is for oh, like for for uh, like say TCP flows? Mm, we could sure, take it as an better. action. They're quite long, but uh, we could take it as an action. I guess we could look at VFP and see. No, what no. Well, yeah, and this is also configurable on the SLB. So for some flows, like for uh, for a SQL SLB, allows to configure this even like thirty minutes. I think. Yeah, yeah. that's what that's what we're going to need to know. What is the program? What is that limit, though? Is it thirty minutes or twenty-four hours? I hope it's not no, no, twenty-four be, hours. But no, but it could be anything. So, so, but. Could you explain more of what you're thinking about timeout of TCP flows? I mean, TCP has sort of natural timeouts in the in the specification, and then that can be altered 
all over the place. You can do all kinds of stuff with particular implementations. So what are you thinking and why is that important? I would say like the majority, like 95 or 8% of the traffic is in the default ones, right? But there are some scenarios, like for example, SQL has a scenario that uh, the connection to SQL can just last for a very, very long and be idle. And that's why SLB had to introduce configuration of timeout on their flow on maxes to, 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 to allow us to support us. So from our data plane, we are not ex, uh, expiring the, some specific flows for like, uh, I think 30 minutes is the max that right now SLB allows to configure. We'll need to double check on this. That's why the keep alive exists, is to keep. Uh, I agree. However, based on our understanding, customers were complaining that not everything uses keep alive and they have it in different clouds <laughs> and mm -hmm. they need it in Azure. Ah. Yeah, okay. So you don't use what's in the spec and then you have to hand configure that. That's okay. Got it. Yeah, I mean, it, it all starts from the point of view, like like we have it somewhere else and we are not being broken and uh, here the connection it's drops, finished. right? It's a bug. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So some people basically rely on, on, on the bugs of not supporting like some specific protocol fully, right? And then and then insist that any other cloud right now should support it because one cloud supports it and it's big customers, so yeah, it happens. So we do it, yeah. Well, let's put it this way. We we can share that information with you. We found out the hard way. You instead of you finding out the hard way, um we can share. Uh, but this is, you know, definitely, you know, a SQL requirement. So um, that's, you know, we get that kind of experience by offering services, right? And it's like being a Cisco uh, compliant with Cisco on a router. It, if they don't adhere to the standards, too bad. You just need to match it because there's too much of it out there. So oh, just the way yeah. it goes. We yeah, used to call it uh, bug for bug compatibility, but that's. <laughs> Hey Joseph, this is Bud. Uh, so the, the reason I was asking it is is basically as we scope out internal data structures, like what kind of resolution, what kind of bit size do we need to maintain timer values and things like that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, well, okay, got it. I have to run. Um, thank you for your time. And I will come up with some, um, like I said, I'll work with Marion and Maddie to come up with some timelines. I'll reach out to different companies for resources specifically. Joseph, um, of course, I'll always do the notes and, you know, feel free to reach out to me, email teams, you know, whatever I can do to be helpful. And um, I'll see you next week. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.